Hey, Mr. Doran, we are now live. Good morning, everybody. I'd like to, um, to thank everybody for coming today for this Committee on Guidelines for Negotiations under the LMRO that we are um, required any year that we do have negotiations to um, form a joint committee between the City Council and the administration um, to entertain presentations from um, all of the unions who we are within negotiations with. Um, I will um, begin by calling roll. Michael Doran, I'm here. Um, Isaac Benton, co-chair. This is Councillor People Corn in for um, Councillor Benton. Thank you, Councillor. Um, Ms. Sandoval. Ms. Sandoval. Good morning, I'm here. Did you unmute it? Thank you, Chief. Um, Councillor Bassan. I am here. Good morning. Good morning. Councillor Pena. Here. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Mr. Davis. Here. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Uh, before we get going, I would like to make a to move um, to make two adjustments to the agenda. First being the other business for CWA to move that from other business to discussion of pending or potential negotiations. Second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Mr. Doran, uh, I believe Ms. Enriquez is on the call to take roll call votes. Oh, okay, so I, I apologize. Uh, Ms. Enriquez. Ms. Enriquez, can you please go ahead? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. Hi, and I, I'm so sorry, I wasn't giving the list of the names I'm taking roll call for. Uh, this is going to be the on the agenda, the six members of the, the committee. Okay, so Michael Isaac, okay, got that. Okay. So we got Michael Doran. Here. Isaac Benton. Councilor Benton is substituted for feeble corn. Oh, that's right. Feeble, yeah. And yes. Yes. Katarina Sandoval. Yes. Okay. Councilor Bassan. Yes. Thank you. Councilor Pena. Yes. Lawrence Davis. Yes. Thank you. That passes on a 6-0. Thank you, Ms. Enriquez. There's been a motion and a second to uh, move CWA from other business to discussion to number three, discussion of pending or potential negotiations. <laughs> Mr. Chair, I thought that's what we just voted on. I'm sorry. I, I apologize. Um, the, the second, I, I move that under number three, APOA was in, unintentionally left off and put under um, prisoner transport. I move that we um, put APOA into number three as well for a discussion of um, the pending or potential negotiations. Mr. Chair, if I can just, because um, we do this pretty regularly uh, with these types of meetings. And so if you wanna just make those changes that's within your discretion as chair to reorganize the agenda and to call up that type of discussion. It might cut down on the number of roll call votes that we'll need. Um, if you'd like a vote, you can call for one, uh, but it's not required in order to make those shifts. It's within your discretion as chair. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez. I'll go ahead and move APOA discussion onto number three as well. Next, we do have the election of the chair. Do I have a motion for any? I move that uh, the current chair, Mr. Michael Doran, uh, be uh, a chair again. You've been do doing such an outstanding job, Mr. Doran, so I nominate you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you. Ms. Enriquez, if you could call the vote. Yes. 
Okay, let's start with um, Councillor Fiebelcourt. Yes. Councillor Bassan. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Catalina Sandoval. Yes. Lawrence Davis. Yes. Thank you. Michael Doran. Yes. That passes on six zero. Thank you, Ms. Enriquez. Um, number two on the agenda is going to be the approval of the May 3rd, 2022 summary minutes. I move for moved for approval. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Enriquez? Councillor Fiebelkorn? Yes. Councillor I abstain. Councillor Peña? Yes. Okay. Catalina Sandoval? Yes. Okay. Lawrence Davis? Yes. Michael Dorian? Yes. That passes on a 5-0. Thank you, Ms. Enriquez. Moving to item number three, discussion of pending or potential negotiations. We'll begin with AFSME Local 1888. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chair? Yes, sir. Sorry, uh, a quick question, and I know we got um, Mr. Melendrez on. Um, I just want to make perfectly clear that uh, does the APOA presentation need to be agendized for the public? Formally, I just want to make it clear. I know some do, some don't. Mr. Chair uh, and Mr. Davis, Mr. Chair, should I respond? Please go ahead, Mr. Melendrez. So I think ideally it would have been on there, and I know that some of our staff had a discussion yesterday with Mr. Broom. Um, however, it doesn't preclude you from hearing from them at this time. The point of this meeting is not to take a vote or action on any of these items. And if, you, if there was going to be a vote, we'd have an agenda issue. But as far as just hearing a presentation and having a discussion, um, that's completely appropriate still, since this is a public meeting that was noticed otherwise. Okay, thank you, uh, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Melendrez. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Ask me, Local 1888, do you have a presentation for the committee? Not at this Chair, time. Go ahead. Mr. Chavez? Yes. Uh, what I would like to say is I was recently assigned uh, Local 1888. I don't know much about what the guidelines committee does. Uh, I got on. I'm here with the with the president, uh, Louis Sosnitos, and uh, uh, my dad's going to not know in the process, but uh, Louis has something to say. I uh, I'll let him speak now. No, I'm good. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mr. Chavez, Mr. Cisneros. Uh, we'll move to IFF Local 244. Do you have a presentation for the committee? Mr. Chairman, this is Paul Broom. I, I spoke with um, Mr. Titman, Miguel Titman, with IAFF uh, just a short time ago, and he asked me to just make a a statement on his behalf because I have represented uh, IAFF Local 244 uh, City Chapter in the past in negotiations. They are on a two-year contract right now. They are not attempting to reopen that contract. There's been no effort by the city to try to reopen that contract. They have uh, a, a compensation increase that, uh, that has uh, been approved at the bargaining table and ratified by the employees and uh, they are pleased with it. They have no desire to try to reopen it. And the city has been not interested in reopening it as, as well. So that's the, that's the extent of uh, his statement, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Broom, I appreciate that. AP, um, next, we'll move to APO Prisoner Transport. Does APOE Prisoner Transport have a presentation for the committee? Greg, if you wish to go ahead and do it right now, you, you can go right ahead and do it, okay? 
Hey, good morning, Mike. Yes, we do have a presentation. So prisoner transport, we're struggling recruiting, retaining individuals in this job. Uh, we've rallied council, council to try to get extra funding for the unit to try to make the wages competitive as well as the You lose it. You're cutting out Mr. Mondegron. Did you go? Okay, I'm sorry. Can you hear me again? Yes, sir. Yes. Okay. So currently right now, uh, there's a misconception that the APOA funding for the general APD budget is that which carries over to the prisoner transport unit. That's not the case. Uh, we wanted to make council and the general committee aware of this to basically ask for some help in getting wages competitive for the job that we do. Uh, right now, the prisoner transport unit uh, transports for seven different agencies. We do the reservations as Leta Sandia, which was just added recently through an MOU, Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, UNMPD, Probation and Parole, the U.S. Marshal's Office, and the Aviation Unit through APD. Uh, right now, we're just around 20 people in the unit itself. A trip up to MDC to book these individuals. It's not a quick process. That's the whole reason the unit was created. Um, taking a group of five people up to the jail, it can take up to eight, nine hours to book them just with the process that MDC has currently. It's not a fast process. In the meantime, while we have those people in custody, we fall under the same guidelines that APD does for use of force, uh, use of force reporting, the investigative procedures for use of force. So it's a lengthy process. Our officers are trained to be able to handle that. However, just with the wages, how they are, it's just not competitive. We're losing people to other agencies. We have a lot of people that are going to other sworn agencies like the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Office, State Police, just because the training that they receive through APD is pretty complete. So you get trained through APD, you go through the same background process you would do as a field officer for APD. However, once you get on, pretty much your advancement opportunities, your wages are pretty much capped as it is right now. Um, our officers are making $23.98 an hour. Uh, right now, that's not competitive for the job that they do, the training that they do annually. To become a prisoner transport officer, you have to complete a APD Academy for prisoner transport officers, which is gonna be 480 hours of instruction through the APD Academy. You get trained through the same firearm trainers that you would going through the field academy. You get trained on the lethal, uh, less lethal uh, weapons, OC, baton, 40 millimeter, taser, beanbag. Uh, you also go through the same annual training that the APD field officers do through the reality-based training center that APD has set up. So you, you get a plethora of training. It's hard to get in. Like I said, the background process is similar to that as you would get going to the field. So we lose a lot of people because just like I'm saying, the pay is not competitive for the job that we do and the individuals that we deal with on a daily basis. You can pretty much go to any other agency locally or even out of state. If you have the requirements to get into the APD prisoner transport unit, more than likely you're gonna get into those same uh, positions anywhere else that you're gonna apply at just because the background process is so similar. Uh, we're losing people to different places uh, throughout the city. Uh, in comparison, let's say ACS, the behavioral health responders supervisors those supervisors are making 22 or i'm sorry 33 dollars and 60 cents an hour uh they're pretty much the same qualifications that you would need to be a supervisor at the prisoner transport unit uh in comparison the prisoner transport unit sergeants make 27 dollars 77 cents an hour the tier one responders through acs are going to be making 27 dollars and 30 cents we're losing a ton of people to acs just because the experience that they get through the transport unit, it carries over working with ACS and what they deal with on a daily basis. Other than you're not as hands-on with individuals, you don't have the same type of clientele in custody. You're, you're just doing a different job, but the requirements to be put in that position are very, very similar. So in comparison, ACS, their behavioral health responders are making $27.30 an hour compared to $23.98 for our APD uh, transport officers themselves. Uh, like I said, we're just asking for help with funding to be allocated to the prisoner transport unit specifically just to get those wages up where they're competitive, where we can actually recruit people and retain people once they're here. 
Uh, we've had an issue retaining people past two or three years just because there's a number of opportunities locally where the experience that you get here, it carries over. So just for the money and the stuff that you deal with, it's a lot easier to go to a different agency or a different part of the city, like I said, ACS or even communications sometimes where the wages are going to be at least two or three dollars higher. I'm not sure if anyone had any questions on the anything yeah. that I have to say. I do, Mr. Chairman. Um, can I address Councilor, the committee? Uh, please go ahead, Councilor Pena. Um, yeah, so this is something that's kind of I've scratched my head over the years. You know, I know um, several years ago when we uh, raises to APOA was an assumption that we were giving to just everybody who was within the police department, right? And then just learning that um, that the prisoner transport wasn't included in that. This is something that I think through amendment city council has supported for the past couple of years, just some additional um, small raises for um, the prisoner transport along with um, other associated groups. Uh, I think um, Ms. Yara can fill in the blanks with that. But my, my question is, and, and I don't know that there's anyone here, but I think it's a dilemma that we have here at the city is that, you know, I've always asked the question that, you know, a prisoner transport, I mean, they're, they're obviously very hands-on. They receive much of the same training. Paul, maybe you can answer this question. There are some things that they, one or two trainings that they don't, um, that the officers do. And I've always looked at it as an entry point to APD is that you can become a transport officer, um, uh, operator and then you can go on to become a police officer but for some reason I always get this glitch that for some reason that just can't happen and this is a way I think that would help to address recruiting um, as we move forward there's 20, 20 transport officers there that do basically you know and they they um, they work with multiple different agencies and it seems like it would be a natural flow into becoming a police officer but there's been some hurdles. Uh, Paul, maybe you can help me to remember what some of those hurdles are. Yes, uh, Mr. Ch Mr. Chairman and Councilor Pena, yes. Uh, we we discussed this at negotiations last year and made some progress. So there, was, there was actually a general uh, desire to, uh, on both sides to actually move in this direction. But I'm going to turn it over to Mr. Mondragon in terms of the of the specifics. He has, he's uh, much more acquainted with that than I am. But go ahead, Greg. So, Ms. Pena, to answer your question, so the APD transport officers, they're all civilian employees through the city and through APD. They don't have any arrest authority. They pretty much just uh, care for the individuals that have already been detained that are in custody through whatever agency arrested them until they get booked into the jail itself. So the APD Academy differs where the APD field officers, the sworn officers, are going to get the, the, the legal training to pretty much be able to arrest someone as well as the MOE uh, that updates them every year. It's annual training that they go through to keep them up to date on the differences that are happening with uh, different laws in New Mexico and how it applies to them in their job position. So one of the hurdles that we've overcome is a lot of the people that come to the prisoner transport unit either use it as a stepping stone to get into another agency just so they get the experience. They don't want to do corrections and a common misconception with our unit and with corrections is it's the same job. It, it's not the same job. In corrections, you have a controlled environment where you're dealing with individuals, where you have a staff in that same building to be able to care for those individuals and to respond to incidents that you may have while they're in custody. Um, I did corrections for about five years prior to this. This has a lot more moving parts. So we have people that are in transport to and from the jail. We assist with different TAC plans at APD and other agencies carry out some of the field. So Say for example, uh, the Northwest Area Command, they were doing a shoplifting tack plan. We help out by assisting those officers going out into the field, getting the arrestees that they have at that time and pretty much taking over custody so they're able to respond immediately to anything else that happens on that tack plan. So we're not taking them out of service, we're just supplementing our job position to be able to get them back into the field, taking calls for service and keeping them out on the streets where the field officers are supposed to be. So it, it's a lot different than corrections. So like I said, in, in lieu of that, we have our officers going out to different locations to go pick up and detain individuals that are under arrest. Uh, we're transporting them a lot of the time to medical facilities. Now that uh, MDC's process has changed a whole lot, pretty much anyone that you arrest, if they have any type of medical issue, you're having them 
cleared at the hospital before they're able to be booked into the jail itself. So our officers say specifically on my shift, I work the graveyard shift. We take four or five individuals, probably in a 10 hour shift to the hospital after they've been rejected by the jail to get medical medically cleared before they're able to be taken back into the jail and transferred to the jail's custody. So in that time, you're dealing with individuals that have felony warrants, have violent crimes that they've been arrested for that don't want to be where they're at currently. No one likes to be arrested, but you're dealing with these individuals for a long amount of time. You're dealing with these individuals in the public eye, in public settings where you're still in custody of them. You still fall under the same use of force policy, the same OBRD camera policy that the field officers are going to fall under. So there's a lot of moving parts to it. So it does differ a lot from corrections. And to answer your question, the the funding that the APD field officers receive, it is separate from the APD uh, prisoner transport officers, <laughs> just because we do have a different contract. So we negotiate for wages through a different contract. So anything that the APOA negotiates for, for the field officers, that's not going to be included for the prisoner transport officers, which I think is a big misconception that a lot of city councilors have had, or just a lot of city officials have had. Uh, Greg, if I may ask a question, okay. Uh, along the line of what uh, Councilor Pena was uh, was discussing, what is, the, what is the biggest barrier preventing uh, or discouraging uh, a prisoner transport officers from actually attempting get into the police academy because we made some progress at the bargaining table on this last year but i know it's still not not working the way it should what's your feeling on that so right now the uh, the years of experience that you have going if say you do become a prisoner transport officer and then you do apply to be a field officer you completely redo your background check you completely redo the physical you can you're you're doing a whole new uh, entrance an application to get into the, the police officer academy itself. Uh, we have a lot of individuals that, quite frankly, they don't want to become a police officer. They want to be in law enforcement, but this is something where they're comfortable with. They'd much rather do this than deal with the law portion of the uh, the actual arrest. So it's just a different job position. So a lot of our officers, after seeing what the field officers go through, just don't want to do it. Um, being here, if you do apply for the police academy and you do get in, your experience here isn't something that's really used all that much. So say you have five years in the prisoner transport unit, you apply, go through the whole background process again with APD, even though you've been working with the city, you're working with APD uh, without a break, you do that whole process again. You're standing in that academy class when you do graduate that academy class. It's only based on the years of experience that you've been here. So say you have a PSA that's been here for five years, a prisoner transport unit officer that's been here for five years, their ranking in that particular APD uh, graduating class, it, it, that's where their ranking is gonna be a little bit higher. So they take into consideration the years of experience that they have there, but that's pretty much it. Like I said, you're completely redoing the process again to apply for a field position. Uh, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Willoughby, President of the APOA wanted to add something on behalf of Mr. Mondragon and the PTOs. Please go ahead, Mr. Chairman. We have to have you. Okay. Go ahead, Mr. Willoughby. Uh, Mr. Chairman, hold on one second. We're having a technical issue. Mr. Doran, may I? Make a comment while uh, Mr. Willoughby. Of, of course, Mr. Nichols, go ahead. There you go. Mm -hmm. uh, city councilors, my name's Brian Nichols. I'm a lawyer at Modrel Sperling. I am, uh, I have a, the city of Albuquerque has a contract with Modrel for me to be the lead negotiator. I've been the lead negotiator for say five years. <clears throat> so with regard, just a couple of things with regard to what Mr. Uh, Mondragon uh, told you, all of which I assume is true. Uh, this much of the barriers in between PTU and sworn officer are a result of state requirements. You heard him say people had to go to the academy and so forth. So the state has certain requirements where certain experience 
with the prisoner transport unit does not translate into what the state requires to become a sworn officer. With regard to resetting the clock for purposes of longevity um, it, with the city, that's a decision that the sworn officers in the APOA contract have requested from the city. So the city collective bargaining agreement with Albuquerque Police Officer Association counts only sworn time as an officer toward longevity. So that's the barriers are not in the unilateral discretion of the city. I wanted to make some of that clear. Probably some are, but a lot of them are not. Everything just to say about this bargaining unit is uh, Mr. Mondragon is, of course, correct that it's a different bargaining unit. And therefore, any economic package to the sworn officers does not translate to the prisoner transport officers. However, in my years of negotiating on behalf of the city with the prisoner transport unit, the prisoner transport unit has gotten very considerable pay increases uh, over the time that I've been here uh, under the current CAO and the past CAO. So um, I don't wish the impression to be left if it was that PTU has been left in the dust and received nothing just because it didn't receive what sworn officers received. It's gotten, I don't know the numbers and I don't know how they compare to APOA sworn, but I would guess that they're probably uh, among the top two or three pay increases that city em that bargaining unit city employees have received over the past six years. It'd be a little hard to say because security and transit and fire and police have all gotten substantial raises in the years, just from my view. Of course, that's a subjective term, but I did want to make it clear that the barriers are not within the unilateral discretion of the city, as far as I'm aware. And also, uh, it's a separate bargaining unit, but there have been significant pay increases. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Uh, Mr. 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 Will, Mr. Can I just add to that just real quickly? I know Councilor Bassan has had her hand up for, for a minute now, but just wanted to add to that. One of the things is that um, they have, I think Ms. Yada, again, I'm going to point to her and I, I don't mean to do that if you don't know the answer, but there has been some bargaining units that are fall with, with um, under the radar a bit. And this would be like for security and for APOA. And there's a list of them that every, um, every year that we do the budget that I'll put an amendment that supported by the rest of the council um, for those bargaining units. So um, can you tell me some of those? Um, yeah, um, yeah, Mr. Chairman and Councilor Pena, this is Stephanie Yada. I'm sorry, I didn't have that information in front of me right now, but I know that we maintain a list of all the bargaining unit increases for the last 10 years in our budget document, and it is currently out there in the proposed document. So I just need to pull that for you and I can send that out to this group to see how those have changed over the years. Unless Mr. Davis has that handy, I doubt we were ready for that. But. Yeah, and I can pull it up and share my, oh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, I can pull it up uh, it, it, probably in a couple of minutes if I can. Mr. Chairman, sorry about that. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, I think it's like clerical, it's security, it's transport. There, there's like a list that I have every year that it's kind of the the ones that fall with under the radar a little bit. So anyway, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Willoughby, before we um, go back to you, um, Councillor Bassan has had her hand up for a while, maybe that you can answer your um, her questions in your presentation as well. Councillor Bassan. Mr. Chair, uh, one of them is actually to follow up with Mr. Willoughby too on his, his perspective of the APOA negotiations when it comes to the PTU and then versus the sworn officers. So I would love clarification on that. But how many, um, Mr. Madragon, how many officers, you said you have about 20 now, how many would you need to be fully staffed? Right now, we're not on a 24-hour schedule. I believe we put together a 24-hour schedule about two years ago. Uh, it would need to be at least about 30 people. So we do cover the hospital guard duty as well. To be able to cover that 24-7 as well, we'd actually probably need another five officers on top of that. So about another 14 altogether. Okay. And then, so thing, uh, sorry, go ahead. So one thing to consider is, so anytime that we don't have officers to work at the PTC, we supplement those with field officers through the use of overtime. So 
the main purpose of the PTC is to keep the field officers out on the street, out taking calls for service during that time. Uh, when we have officers out covering PTC spots to be able to transport people to jail or to cover those hospital duty spots, it's kind of taken a step back where we're not keeping those officers in the field taking calls for service where they're supposed to be. Okay, uh, and Mr. Chair, and what, where, sorry, I'm collecting all my questions in my head at once. Uh, what other funding do you all get from the other departments? You said there's seven that you assist. Is the city of Albuquerque responsible for all the funding? I believe well, we do work out of a BCSO, uh, or I'm sorry, a county building uh, through Bernalillo County. Uh, I'm not sure if there's any funding other than that. I'm not aware of there being any other than just the use of the building. Probation and parole is providing funding. I'm not sure what the actual funding that they're providing since it's a new MOU. Uh, we were made aware of that through a meeting. As far as everyone else, uh, U.S. Marshals, UNM, and the Reservation Police is Leda and Sandia. I don't believe we're getting anything from those agencies. Uh, and thank you. Does anybody else have verification on that or is there something different or is that what we go with? More information on that, it could be obtained from uh, DC Smathers with APD. He's the one that oversees our unit itself. Okay, I guess, Mr. Chair, I'm wondering if anybody else on this meeting knows if that seems accurate or <clears throat> curious if the city of Albuquerque is pretty much the sole responsibility to pay the wages of these officers when they're also helping out with the other agencies. Mr. Davis, um, can you speak to that? Yes, Mr. Chair, Councilor Bassan, not to my knowledge. Um, you know, we have LEC in agreement with Bernalillo County, but as far as I know, we do not collect from, um, you know, Isleta, Sandia, U.S. Marshals, UNM, as far as I know. Okay. Uh, Mr. Chair, a couple more, if I may. Uh, so I think I know the answer to this question. Probably this is going to be for Ms. Yara, uh, but what is the city doing? What are the plans to minimize attrition with this department? Is this, am I going to hear class and comp study? So, yeah, respectfully, Councillor Basan, that is Mr. Romero's, uh, okay. and I'll let him address that. Thank you both. Good morning, everyone. This is Anthony Romero with uh, the city's human resources department. Um, yes, I've just been uh, checking out some of the comparators for where New Mexico lies on uh, where we're paying them. Right now, we are at, um, after a year of probation, uh, these individuals are sitting at $49,878 a year. Um, and it's looking as if, um, you know, we got uh, um, one of the lowest, uh, one of the lowest paid annual salaries is in the state of Louisiana at 37,000. New Mexico's average is about 41,359, and they're sitting at um, 49,878. But also looking at the um, uh, class and comp study, as we're defining what those uh, benchmarks are going to be and how we weight our benefit package, um, we'll uh, look to see where that 49,000 um, sits in line with uh, the guiding principles we set during the class and comp study. Okay, and Mr. Chair, uh, what, so I kind of, there's one more question, but then I do wanna hear Mr. Willoughby's stance and position kind of on the questions I've asked as well. Uh, but what can council do, Mr. Mondragon, uh, to start with you, I guess, what can council do to increase these wages? Because I know that we're not allowed to be involved in the bargaining agreement or the negotiations and all of that, but you know, what can we do Honestly, I'm not sure. So one of the issues that we have is, like I said, everyone thinks that APOA's main police contract falls in line with ours. The job position is so unique where it's not a corrections job itself. So the wages, the wage comparison, I don't think it's something that's accurate to compare a CO in Louisiana or a CO here locally in New Mexico to that of what the transport unit officers do. I know that the department itself has been looking to supplement the PTU's job position with privatized security, which it's quite a bit more expensive. I know they got quotes through uh, IPS for hospital guard duty. IPS quoted them $600 for a four hour 
uh, basically just for showing up for four hours, watching a prisoner, not doing any type of transports, anything like that. Um, I know the department itself has been weighing these using privatized security, and I just don't think it's the right option to go. I know city council probably has some leverage in that, saying that if you have funding to be able to give out to a privatized security agency to do the same job, you have the money to be able to actually bolster this position, retain people, hire new people to, for this position itself. I don't think getting outside security is the answer to that. And I'd hope city council would agree with that as well. Thank you. So Mr. Chair, if we can hear from Mr. Willoughby on any and all of the points or which, whatever's in the parameters of the allowability here. Of course, uh, <clears throat> Mr. Willoughby, uh, please go ahead. Mr. Chair, thank you so much, Councillor Bazan. Um, thank you for the opportunity just to engage on this particular issue. I think it's important to understand historically the reason why these are two separate bargaining units was done by design, right? When we started the actual PTU, um, there was a lot of turmoil with the administration and the department, and we did not feel that it was fair or ideal to have a bunch of frustrated police officers voting on contracts for uh, a, a newly established PTU. So they are their own standalone bargaining unit. Um, one of the, yeah, I'm so glad that Greg, who did a great job representing the, the PTU today, um, I, what, I'm, what I'm really concerned about with this bargaining unit is that, you know, the, the city of Albuquerque Police Department who manages this, this arena, um, they are constantly out and about talking about privatization of this particular group of employees, which is going to cost the city of Albuquerque more money than just funding these employees to be a stepping stone for APD. For the life of me, I don't understand why we haven't over the past seven to 10 years that we've had the PTU or our PSA program really bolstered hiring for these programs as a stepping stone into APD. And what happens right now, and um, you know, uh, the negotiator Brian is correct, when you join the Albuquerque Police Department, it's a whole nother contract. You get benefits within your academy structure on your seniority, but the time you've invested with your city basically starts over with the police department. That being said, I think that uh, this is kind of a no brainer. I think what council can do is seriously look at the budget and the, the where money is going in this budget and, and, and funnel more resources to this particular bargaining unit for competitive wages. I also think that it is a challenge to compare class and comp with this particular group of employees. Not every single police department has a transport center. You can't really compare it with, with corrections because it is a completely different job. They provide a different service for the city of Albuquerque Police Department than a lot of other agencies have. So class and comp studies is not going to give you an accurate reflection of what these employees actually have to do. They're expected to do more with less like everybody else in the Albuquerque Police Department as it relates to the administrative burden of the DOJ consent decree. And the, the, the number one problem is while the administrators in the city of Albuquerque Police Department are focusing on privatizing this with security companies, they should be focusing on a competitive wage to get people in the door so that we don't have a 10 employee deficit in this, in this particular junction of the police department. I think that there are uh, several concerns. It is not very expensive for the city to invest in, in, in these employees, and I think it should be considered. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Davis, you have, have your hand up. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if you would allow me to share my screen, I could pull up um, the compensation by bargaining unit that Ms. Yada was talking about. We'll keep it over a 10 year period. That way, if any of you, it's in the budget document, um, page 40, but I can give you a brief preview uh, real quick. And hopefully you can see that, Mr. Chairman. Um, and the way this designed it tracks over time. Some of these amounts, some of these totals over here, you'll have to pay particular attention to because they have a lot of notes associated with them. Sometimes unions do not select to increase their compensation, but other, um, other compensation methods such as longevity or the para pickup, they choose other options. So pay particular attention when you are comparing, okay, just go to the total. Who has received what over 10 years? You have to read, be sure you read all the notes associated with them because sometimes unions do not 
choose to affect their compensation, but other elect other compensation methods along with that. But this is the table Ms. Yada was talking about that's in your budget book, page 40. And that's all I got, Mr. Chairman. If you want me to leave it, leave it up. If not, I, I could take it down, Mr. Chairman. Does anybody need to have it left up or? All right, if you can take it down, Mr. Davis, I, I'd appreciate it. I can just look at it for a, uh, nope. <laughs> right. get it for a second. I was just trying to evaluate something <laughs> in my head. If not, um, Lawrence, can you, uh, Mr. Davis, can you send us this form? Sure, I can send it out. Okay, okay, then I'm good, thank you. Thank, thank you, you. Uh, I'm sorry. Um, we have Mr. Romero, it looks like your hand is up. Thank you, Mr. Doran, and um, uh, good job, Mr. Mondragon. I just also wanted to state for uh, the record to everybody on the call, we currently have 23 field uh, PTOs in the system with nine vacancies, so a total of 32 budgeted. I know that earlier, Mr. Mondragon said that his fully staffed number should be 30. Um, it's at 32. Thank you, sir. Mr. Nichols, I see your hand up. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, so just again, for a little bit of response to uh, Councillor Bassan's question, this bargaining unit in particular, in the last contract, uh, we the city decided to agree to something to try and increase retention. So um, I, you know, Based on what I know and what I've been told, reten the retention issue arises between years two and five. So for this bargaining unit, we agreed to an annual compensation instead of by pay period, which laddered up to the bottom of the longevity table to see if that would help people. Um, I use the word bridge those years. So uh, I just wanted the counselor to know that, you know, uh, we're looking at retention. We're trying things. We've tried things with this unit. I don't know exactly how well it's gone. Um, it's a small unit, so it's a little hard to tell. But it being a small unit, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to try it here to see if it would help out. I did want to follow up on a comment that uh, Mr. Davis made regarding uh, unions taking other forms of economic compensation in lieu of raises. Those would be things like para pickups. Okay. So increasing the amount. These are just examples. I don't know, you know, there's nine contracts, so I can't tell you who did what when, but para pickups, which is where the city pays an increased amount of the employees percentage of the amount paid to the public employee retirement account. Uh, increased accruals of vacation or sick. Uh, it's we're, we're commonly asked for additional types of leave, jury duty, um, bereavement. Um, and so those sometimes uh, register uh, across the board and sometimes not. And, you know, basically the unions are asking for increases on what the city's baseline is in rules and regs. Uh, some other examples would be uh, education compensation uh, for for either going to school or obtaining a degree. Again, an increase of, um, above the baseline that the city offers all employees uh, and so forth. So those are the kind of things that uh, might those are examples that might. Um, that Mr. Davis was referring to. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Nichols. Councillor Bassan. I got excited about the mute button. Uh, Mr. Chair, I just wanted to clarify, is the 32 that Mr. Uh, Romero said, is that for the 24 hour or is that just with the schedule that we have now? That is the number that they're budgeted for. And then there's also um, four uh, APD prisoner transport sergeants um, added to that number. Mr. Mondragon, you have your hand up. You're muted, Mr. Mondragon. 
And yeah, I was going to say, so there is four current sergeants at the PTU now. I believe, like they were saying, four more were budgeted for. Uh, we've never come close to the 30, to staffing fully for the 30 officers and the four additional sergeants. Um, we have received quite a bit of an increase throughout the years through past negotiations. However, we've been playing catch up trying to get the wages competitive where we're actually able to get those people in the door. Like I said, once we get those people in the door, nine out of times, nine out of the 10 times we're getting people that just leave after they've been here well within under five years or probably five years tops. In my graduating class, there was seven PTU officers that graduated, including myself. I believe out of that seven, there's only myself and one other officer in that class left. I've been here for eight years now. Um, once I took over the negotiations for the PTU, I believe these guys are making about 16 to $17 hourly uh, just for the job and the service that they provide, not only for APD, but as well as all the other surrounding agencies. It, it just wasn't competitive at the time. And I believe we've been playing catch up to try to get it to a competitive wage where we're able to get people in the door. Like Sean said, get them in the door, either keep them here at the PTU to be able to bolster these positions or get them into the APD Academy itself, use it as a stepping stone to get field officers on the streets. Uh, the department hasn't used it for that. And I believe a lot of the problems that we've had, it's just, it's not competitive. You're able to, to go anywhere else, do somewhat of a similar position, go through the same background process, go through the same application process. And a lot of times get paid five or more dollars more for doing what our officers are doing. Thank you, Mr. Mondragon. Mr. Willoughby. Thank you, Mr. Chair. The only other thing I'd like to add to this conversation is that when it comes to recruiting for a PTU officer, the city of Albuquerque Police Department, in my opinion, is not primarily focused on recruiting for this particular job position. This particular job position gets lost in the shuffle of trying to recruit for police officers. Maybe somebody's not old enough. We happen to talk to one individual that um, has a little bit of growing to do based on, on their record, and we encourage them to, to go to the PTU. But I don't think that fundamentally the city is really focused on recruiting for these particular job functions. Uh, we're definitely not viewing the PTU or the PSA program as, as a stepping stone to try to tap into a younger generation, somebody that may be qualified to do this particular job and then grow into a police officer. Uh, it's kind of a, it's just, it's kind of an afterthought because I believe the police department is primarily focused on recruiting police officers and the PTU seems to get forgotten about. Um, I believe that's why the, the current administration at the chief's office is looking to privatize this particular entity. The union is 100% against that concept. We do not think that is going to be beneficial for the city or the citizens of Albuquerque or our police department. Uh, but it does show, it does prove that they this is an important attribute of the police department and they are willing to take money in their budget to throw at this, um, but maybe we just need to be more creative um, and make sure we're competitive and make sure we're recruiting for this category. And that's all I have. Thank you, Mr. Willoughby. We'll move next to the AFSME locals. Do the AFSME locals have a presentation? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, my name is Stoll Villarreal. I'm a staff representative for AFSCME Council 18. I am. Uh, I was newly assigned to the Albuquerque area for Local 624, which is the Albuquerque Blue Collar and the Transit Unit. Local 2962, which is the White Collar Local, and uh, the Albuquerque M Series, the supervisor, the supervisor's local. Um, I really just uh, want to say a few words, uh, as you all know. Uh, we're it currently in contract negotiations, so there's really not much that we can really say as regarding to specifics, seeing as how those are uh, closed sessions, right, by law. Um, so keep this very simple, right? I, I believe, as you've heard from our uh, previous locals here, right, the biggest problem seems to really be uh, just with the cost of living here right now. I think what we're looking for is to ask that, um, that the city look into when they're regarding the budget, also consider know that there's been a lot of talk there uh, with the public safety locals of which one of ours, uh, you know, 1888 is also a member, right? But I think um, it can't be forgotten that our blue collar locals, right? Our white collar locals, our M-series, they're facing the same struggles there within the city, right? Um, 
the cost of living right here uh, within the last year, right? Um, even though it's gone down significantly, you're still, you saw it there with your own numbers there. And that was, uh, that was urban inflation there in the area, right? It's still over 5%, right? And so, um, you know, we would ask that when the city is uh, looking at budgeting, because that's really all I think we can really ask for here very generally, right, is when you all look at budgeting, that you please look at that and, and take that into consideration when you all are looking at the expenses of what, uh, you know, our members are also facing. Um, that 5% cost of inflation, I think also doesn't do justice to uh, the actual facts of what a lot of our members have to face, right? A lot of our blue collar members are some of, uh, you know, uh, some of the lower paid members here within the city, right? I'll, I'll just say it, and and even some of our uh, white collar employees. And and so um, for us, well, we'd all, you know, it, it, we also face another real reality, right? It's not just the cost of living generally, right? The cost of rent here within Albuquerque, right, has just uh, risen significantly. I know the city council has been doing a lot to address that with our uh, um, most some of our most vulnerable populations. And I think that is greatly considered because as a community, we need to be doing that, right? We would just ask that, you know, it not be forgotten for those people that are out there, right, out the, on the front lines, keeping our city, right, uh, going here. Um, you know, um, we would really ask that, you know, I know wages are hard right now. Um, that compounded with what um, happened there with the penal lawsuit. Another thing that had to address a very needed disparity, right? But in reality, it left us really, right, with, with a lot of problems there. I think as far as dynamics there within our bargaining units, the, the classifications of individual classes that right now don't make any sense at all, right? You have, you have structures, right, pay grades, where people two or three levels down, right, the actual average pay rate in there is a lot higher than the actual people that are supervising them or overseeing them at a higher level, right? That, those are the kind of things I know you all are trying to address there for long term, right? But our people, you know, what to our understanding, a lot of this is being looked at as uh, Mr. Willoughby uh, uh, stated earlier, right, through this class and comp study, to which there may not be any uh, uh, movement there, depending on what the outcome of this study shows, right? And so for us, right, it's it's a very long time away before it looks like anybody really wants to address that. And so what we're asking for in the meantime, right, just in the meantime, while we're getting there, right, that that the city, please look at something in that interim moment, because, you know, facing the cost of inflation during this time has still been a very real thing that we have to do. Um, our our departments are equally have, have been equally battered, right, by uh, not just the pandemic, but uh the inability, right, to be able to rehire since those times. We have areas that are extremely uh, um, um, underfunded, right, and and that are uh, very, uh, um, excuse me, I'm looking for the, um, the a lot of those uh, vacancies, right, in those uh, agencies are there. So um, we would just ask you guys, again, please consider uh, uh, looking at those, at those funds when you're looking at these other agencies. Do not forget about you know, these other people that are doing the jobs that a lot of people don't think about, right, more than uh, um, whenever they need to uh, either uh, get their trash filled or whenever they've got to pay a bill or whenever something like that's got to happen, right? I mean, um, these are these are the people that are doing the, the life's work of the city. So um, thank you very much for your time. And um, we'll also stand for questions. I know that uh, we have uh, um, one of our local presidents here for uh, the supervisor series that, um, although he was, for some reason was not on the uh, agenda, uh, would also uh, like to speak as well, if, if the chair would so allow. Mr. Romero, would you like to go ahead? Yeah, uh, my name is Augustine Romero. I'm the Ask Me 3022 president. Thank you for the opportunity. Our, our biggest challenge has been the, the way the penal lawsuit was settled. Um, it's created a, a scenario where it created um, more inequity in, in the process of trying to solve some equity. And that's um, where we're at at the moment. I appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Romero. We'll move on to CWA. Mr. Chair, thank you. Uh, members of the committee, how are you? My name is Milagro Padilla. I'm a national campaign lead with the Communications Workers of America. And I'm here today with the Community Safety Responders Union. We represent um, a group of folks at Albuquerque Community Safety. Um, 
you know, I don't have a whole lot for you today. Uh, we're relative, well, we're brand new to the city. Um, our background is definitely at the state, uh, UNM, CNM, APS here in New Mexico, uh, as far as public sector goes. Um, but we're looking forward to making sure that we're able to continue the truly transformative work that ACS is doing in the community. Um, I was born and raised here in Albuquerque, and it feels really, really good to have a program that is being highlighted nationally um, for the work that they are doing. Um, I want to make sure that these people who are doing the work are taken care of um, and that the amount of people doing that work continues to grow. When we came in, we had something like 20, um, 20 folks in our bargaining unit. Um, as far as I understand, the plan is to grow that pretty significantly. I think that is the right call um, and any support that we can get from the council um, and making sure that that's possible will be tremendous. So um, we're looking forward to the negotiations. We've just got sort of the ground rules kicked off um, and we're, we're looking forward to being a part of this. We're happy to be here. Thank you all for your time. Thank you, Mr. Padilla. Before we move to APOA, uh, Mr. Chavez, I believe wanted to make a clarification Yes, uh, thank you. Uh, I didn't know we were supposed to, uh, we were able to give a presentation for this. Uh, like Joel said, we're in negotiations, can't ask for much, but uh, city security needs uh, money for retention and recruitment. Uh, they're right now staffing levels. They're walking off every day. We're losing people. We have about 64. Uh, we should have 140 officers for city security. Uh, they, they're not staying with the city. Uh, we're losing to the private security companies, code enforcement inspections, uh, and other private uh, security uh, agencies. We need uh, also funding for training equipment for dealing with uh, transit security. Uh, they recently took on transit. There's going to be a lot of new uh, additional officers needed for that. So uh, I guess we're asking for help on, on that also. And that's what I got. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chavez. Mr. Cisneros, I'm sorry, do you have your hand up? Yes, sir. I just wanted to add to that. Um, we've lost 77 officers and 14 supervisors to either outside city employment or other agencies within the city over the last three years. We're having a big problem with retention in regards to just being able to keep our people here and being competitive with uh, other city entities and private security. That's it, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Cisneros. We'll move to APOA. Uh, Mr. Broom or Mr. Willoughby has a presentation, I believe, a PowerPoint. Thank if you me. could allow them to share their screen. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I will make a presentation. Let me, we're gonna get, have a little problem here with technology. Did you turn it up? All right. I think I think that's better. Uh, first of all, Mr. Chairman, I want to thank uh, yourself and, uh, and Elaine Romero uh, for actually putting this guidelines committee together, and we we really very much appreciate it. Uh, Councilor uh, Bassan raised a very we I, we believe important question. In other words, what can the council do to make sure that they have some level of involvement? And that's the reason why we asked for this meeting, because we wanted to bring the council and the mayor's office together to try to consider uh, the needs of the APOA and PTU. And of course, we share the same concerns as, uh, as ASME and CWA in this regard. If the council can make sure well, during the budget process, question the mayor's office as to whether or not the the raises or the money for the raises are actually contained in the budget, that will be very, very helpful during this budget process. I sent out a power, 
a point presentation uh, to uh, most of you on, on the committee. I was not aware that uh, uh, Councilor Feeblecorn was going to be on the, uh, the committee. So, Councilor, I'll make sure I send a copy of that to you. If anybody else uh, who's participating in this process want a copy of the um, the PowerPoint presentation, I'd be happy to um, uh, send it out to you. Please just let me know. And my uh, my email address is on the uh, is under my um, my picture on the uh, the Zoom. So feel free to send that out if you would. Uh, the requests that we're making uh, to the uh, to the uh, guidelines committee and of course in negotiations is basically a cost of living increase. We are not trying to actually uh, exceed other people and turn other uh, entities throughout the country. What we're just trying to do is basically uh, replenish as much of the cost of living as we possibly can in our negotiations. And we left out one important entity in the, um, the PowerPoint presentation, and that is Bernalillo County. It is the 800 pound gorilla in the room when it comes to negotiations that are being taken place between the APOA and the uh, and uh, the city. Uh, the county is already in negotiations with uh, their, the union representing the deputies there. They've had a couple of meetings and the, the sheriff there has made it very clear in private as well as public statements that he intends to actually achieve parity with a, uh, APD in terms of compensation for his deputies. And I believe him, I take him at his word. There's no question that if that occurs and, and employees and officers that we actually have here in Albuquerque have the opportunity to make the same salary same benefits with para and not have the uh, the uh, the problem of the GOJ and and internal affairs investigations that are going on on a on a continuous continuous basis and going to Bernalillo County where they're allowed to do police work we are going to have a very serious problem by the time we get back to negotiations uh here with the city uh and it will be in a short period of time i suspect very much in terms of my contracts with uh, the deputies, that they may very well have a contract uh, negotiated at that time. And we will make sure that that information is brought four square to the city of Albuquerque. We must maintain parity. Let me turn this over now to Mr. Willoughby, if I may, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brew. Mr. Willoughby? Here it is. Can you guys hear me? Okay, thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for the opportunity. Um, as Paul said, we created a, a pretty a, a pretty good presentation for anybody that would be interested to, to peruse it. Um, basically, what it shows in a nutshell is that, and I, I think it's important to establish some history here, right? Because you, you guys, as we saw earlier on the screen today, we, we saw a great deal of investment that has come from the leadership of uh, this administration and the city council into trying to address uh, what is going on in this industry called policing and trying to maintain or work our way towards some competitive edge in the southwest region of the United States. What this PowerPoint is going to show you is that although we've made strides to achieve that goal, we still have some work to do. Um, we are still uh, lacking competitive edge against Colorado Springs. Denver, uh, Phoenix just blows us away. They're a bigger city. They have a bigger budget. Um, there are a lot of agencies in Texas that we do not compete with, uh, but we have done uh, a, a great deal of investment to try to be more competitive. And this is coming off of about an eight year stead of not only Albuquerque police officers taking an 8% reduction in pay through the last mayoral administration, but a stagnant no increase of wages um, for approximately eight years. So we've we had some catching up to do. I think we've made that catching up. 
Um, as Paul noted, we are asking for basically a cost of living increase. Um, you really have to ask yourself, um, you know, we're technically in negotiations. There's some we cannot uh, talk about right now, but what I can talk about is, is what is public. And what is public is the mayor's budget. And uh, the increase that is established in that budget, I, I really want this committee and the council to ask themselves, is that is that doing our due diligence for the problems that this police department faces? You know, as you go through the PowerPoint, um, you're gonna to come to page three. Now page three really talks about how many police officers that are doing the work in the city of Albuquerque. How many, how many men and women are out there doing police work? And what you look at sworn officers for PD, on the left-hand side, you're going to see the number that we have. And on the right-hand side, you're going to see what our vacancy ratio is. And we're not going to publicly, because this is live streamed, <laughs> we're not going to talk about what's going on in the aviation department, but we have 731 police officers in the streets of Albuquerque doing the work from Lieutenant to P1C. And we have nine P2Cs, which are our rookies, 41 cadets. So I know that city council hears from the administration, there's 850, there's this many officers, that number changes every single day. We only calculate guys that are doing police work. We don't calculate everybody on management on the fifth floor or the invented classification of deputy commander, which there, there are so many of them who basically they're lieutenants that get to call themselves deputy commander. We do not calculate management and we do not calculate everybody else. That's the number of cops that you have. This last year, we, had, we have a bid every single year. Some of you know what the bid is, some of you don't. A bid is annually police officers have the ability to use their earned seniority to work in different attributes of field services. Maybe they want to go to a different part of town. Maybe they want to work for a particular sergeant. Maybe they want to stay in the area that they're working to earn compensation for doing so. 300. We bid 300 police officers and within a week of that bid that turned into below 300 because there were a lot of transfers that were being conducted. 300 police officers for a city this size is absolutely terrifying. We have made investments. We're trying to control attrition. We've got incentivization through monetary gain to have a retention program. This, it's not cutting the mustard, right? We've just increased and invested on the front end for our cadets and our P2Cs to have a significant pay increase. I, for one, think that that was necessary. I think that we lacked a competitive edge um, on our cadet pay and our, and our P2C, our rookie pay. Um, I, I was pleased to see that happen. I think it will help. Uh, we've seen somewhat of a slow when it comes to early retirements because of the retention, but we're still losing police officers <clears throat> every single day to both retirement they're leaving the profession altogether, or they're going to other agencies throughout the country to receive higher compensation and what they would consider more support. I think it's really, really indicative to understand. I mean, you're going to see a class and comp. We have class and comp all over our study. We've looked at some departments that the city looked at. We've looked at other departments that we're often compared to. But when one thing you have to take into consideration in class and comp is that not all of those studies are created equal and not all the jobs of police officers are created equally. We have to contend with the consent decree here in Albuquerque. We have to do more with less. For instance, let's just keep it real simple and here at home. There were 15 IA investigations in the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department last year, one five. We had over 1,500. And each one of those investigations has an average of over four police officers. Our officers are being investigated thousands of times a year. Sometimes 10, 15 times a year, they're in internal affairs getting investigated for simply doing the job of police officers. This administrative burden that this city is undergoing is directly related to the consent decree. You cannot compare the city of Albuquerque Police Department against another department that is not undergoing a consent decree. Our officers do not feel supported. They feel like they're simply doing their job and they're constantly getting in trouble. And a lot of them are miserable at work. 
one of the only tools that the city has is to increase and continue on the path of ensuring that we maintain a competitive edge, not only in the state of New Mexico, but in the region of the Southwest region of the United States. I cannot implore you more about how scary that number should be to you as elected officials representing a city that wants to be safe and wants to control crime. 731 police officers is dismal. We have several challenges, not only in the profession of law enforcement is it challenging to begin with, to recruit, retain, and hire a next generation of police officers. We have the added bonus that we're dealing with a decades old consent decree that I don't care what anybody tells you, I don't see it disappearing in the next four years. And who knows what political attributes are going to continue this consent decree into the future uh, because we're serious about the reforms that we've made. We, in my opinion, do not possess the staff to perform to the level that the DOJ requires in the consent decree. We have not been creative enough as a city to actually receive or gather the data that shows this so that we could convey it to the federal court. And the problems that we have here are unlike any other department. BCSO doesn't have a vacancy ratio of 287 officers. We've lost over 400 officers in the last four years. The state police doesn't have an attrition rate that we have. They don't have the vacancies that we have. I would argue that there is not a single police department in the state of New Mexico, New Mexico that struggles the way that APD has struggled, and it is directly related to the consent decree. We have to know that going forward. The consent decree is not going anywhere. And the way that our department operates is not going to change overnight simply because of four years from now, we're out of this consent decree. We still, have, we still have a use of force policy that is overly restrictive. We still have our number one recruiting tool in the entire city, not recruiting for this department. And those are the officers that actually work here. There are challenges and I, and I would beg you that what is publicly known is what's in the mayor's budget for police and salary increases. That is not enough. We have to do it, cost of living increase. I believe we're asking for five to 6%, which is consistent with what state police got this year, which is consistent with what, um, what we're hearing is coming out of the negotiating table with BCSO. It is consistent with what's going on throughout the country. And when you take into account the inflation numbers, it's really just maintaining a cost of living increase. The city of Albuquerque has a significant problem on its hands. It is continuing, continuing to civilianize the attributes of this police department. For instance, for the first time in 20 years, we have a civilian helicopter pilot for um, Air One, which is our police helicopter. We have 45 to 60 internal affairs investigators that are investigating cops that are civilians. Um, we have ACS that are out there trying to help out. At the end of the day, you're not going to be able to civilianize this police department. At the end of the day, you're going to need police officers as old fashioned as they may be. You have to recruit and retain police officers. This city deserves it. This city demands it. And um, I just don't think we're putting our best foot forward in the budget that, that came down to city council from the Keller administration um, trying to continue on the path of recruiting and retaining. It's almost like we've given up. Um, it's almost like we're not going to accomplish the goals that we set forth. So we're going to give up. We're going to reinvent. We're going to defund. We're going to move money wherever we can because we have failed. And I will tell you that we have not failed. We just have to continue the hard work we have to get out of this consent decree and we have to make sure that this police department is still standing when we do it. The city of Albuquerque de demands it and they deserve it. Um, but there's a lot of information in our packet. I think it's very, very interesting. I think we still have a considerable amount of work to do that is proven in this packet to maintain a competitive age edge in this region and in the state of New Mexico. Um, high tides raise all ships, right? So the city of Albuquerque has made a solid investment over the last eight years into the salaries of this police department, but it also rose ships all around us. 
You saw major raises with state police last year. You're seeing um, parity raises with BCSO. And I will tell you this, it's kind of scary for me. Um, BCSO for the longest time, in order to become a, a Bernalillo County Sheriff, you had to go through a complete full academy, which is six months of a bunch of stuff that nobody that works here wants to do. They have created a what's called a gentleman's academy, which is a lateral academy, which is significantly condensed. I think on the last testing phase, we heard rumor, and I have not verified this with recruiters or their agency, over five Albuquerque police officers testing to join the lateral academy at the Bernalillo County Sheriff's Department. And if they get pay parity or they increase or trump our pay at BCSO, you will see a ton of highly trained Albuquerque police officers lateral to that agency. And you will see that number of 731 continue to dwindle. And by the time we are able to respond to that, it'll be too late. Other than that, I'm open for questions. Uh, please ask them if you would like. Thank you, Mr. Willoughby. Does any of the committee have any questions for Mr. Willoughby? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I would just say that, you know, I really appreciate, um, you know, the number of boots on the ground. I think we've been asking that question at council for, for a long, long time. So um, that number is very, very helpful. And then I was gonna ask, I mean, you have any presentation about the tr prisoner transport officers? I know we kind of beat that one to death, but if you um, if you wanna highlight anything about that within your presentation, I would appreciate it. And then you actually said something about ACS. I just, you know, I hear, I hear different, um, different, um, things from different people about ACS and how effective it is and who's the first at the site. And then I'm hearing from different officers that pretty much an officer is there every single time that there's an ACS person. So can you just tell me about how um, effective you see that out on the, out on the street? Um, you know, I, so a a ACS is not an old concept, right? It's a new program, but it's not an old con concept. We used to have um, the budgetary strength that's going to ACS with our coast agency. The, the big problem that I personally have between ACS and the way that we used to do it is really branding. Um, it's a branding argument for me. Uh, you know, I like the fact that we're providing these services to the community that needs them under the Albuquerque police brand, because I think it's an attribute of community policing that's important for police departments to have that community built relationship under the patch of the Albuquerque police department. ACS is nothing new. We've, we've had this program going on in the city of Albuquerque police department for a long time. We've grown it. Um, but uh, we're not seeing, we don't feel the, uh, the, the lack of, I mean, it's not like this burden's been lifted on Albuquerque police officers. There's certain calls that ACS can't respond to. There's certain calls that ACS has to have city security go first and then dictate whether it's a police call or it's an ACS call or we need everybody on, on that call. What we're seeing is that there has to be an Albuquerque police officer on these calls for some kind of scene security because they're the only ones that have the authority to truly protect themselves in certain situations. And ACS is traditionally limited to the individuals they can contact alone, and they're limited to the types of calls for service that, that they can go for. I look at everything as an opportunity to grow the police department because I represent the police department. Um, I, I think that Maybe we'll get some really great police officers out of the ACS program. Maybe we can get great police officers out of the PTU program. I think we should have an internship program with our PSA program and the, the younger generation. To We really need to be focused and minded on the next generation of Albuquerque police officers. We have seen the numbers dwindle every single year and we have challenges. These officers are miserable working for this agency. We are in internal affairs and in trouble. I got a letter of reprimand to an officer about a week and a half ago for wearing the wrong shoes. Like it's absolutely egregious. But that being said, 
we need to be focused on the future. A lot of folks tend to think in election cycles, right? Like the mayor will only think in election cycles. Elected officials tend to think in election cycles, but where are we gonna be five to 10 years from now, less than 600 police officers? Like think of the sacrifices we have made. We no longer have a residential and commercial burglary unit. We, we are gonna get to a point to where our investigative capacity is gonna dwindle to such an extent that only we're only going to be able to respond to calls for service safely in the city of Albuquerque. Our, our investigative resources has have dwindled to such a low expectation of resources, they're triaging these cases. So we can't really make a real impact on crime because of our staffing. We simply don't have the resources and all of these different attributes, whether it's ACS or PTU or our PSA program, I think that fundamentally they should be used as an attribute to funnel these bodies into the police department so that we can, we can worry about our future and we can, we can succeed in the future. I don't see a lot of that going on. I don't know, maybe a lot of the ACS folks would have no interest in being a police officer. But um, I think they, they, they make more hourly than most of our police officers do at the beginning of their career. I think they're a good attribute for the city. I think it's good to be able to provide services and help individuals that may or may not need it. Um, but it's, it's not a new concept for the city of Albuquerque Police Department. It's just a new name. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I could just add to that, I, I, um, I actually agree with ACS, the PTU and the security, but for whatever reason, um, you know, I've run into to barriers in terms of really moving that forward. So maybe there's something that we can do to create some kind of program that that we can look at that, right? Where it where it's applicable and where we where it's doable, because I think that's just a natural progression, right? With people who kind of can be part of ACS and see, um, you know, how an officer works out in the field and maybe generate some interest in creating that path uh, forward to be able to do that. And it's an advancement and it's a, it's a career ladder, right? From like ACS to, or from security to becoming a police officer. So I'm gonna um, continue to look into that. Um, I know every time I try to, it's been kind of like, there's reasons why, and I think I'm gonna revisit that. So thank you. Well, Councilor, I will, t um, um, Chair, Mr. Chairman, do you mind if I make one comment? Please go ahead. Uh, Councilor Pena, there is a program that I think you might be interested in looking at, and it's more of a conceptualized program. We have five brothers that are police officers here. Most of them are sergeants now. They're the Hernandez brothers, and they come from Oakland. And um, they all wanted to be police officers from a young age. And Oakland has a system where you can be a police service aide as an internship. And you can only be a police, it is a legitimate internship. You either, they're fully staffed and you get a good luck. You are recommended for employment in the world of policing or they funnel those individuals into their academy to ensure that they have fully staffing for their police department. Well, they were fully staffed when one of these PSAs was in Oakland in their PSA program. He got a wonderful letter of recommendation his brother had already been stationed through the military in Albuquerque, and that's why he became a police officer in Albuquerque. But I, the, the concept of having an internship program surrounded about around bolstering staff for a police department is something that I think the city needs to seriously consider into the future. Um, it, it, just, it just is smart. We, uh, we have challenges in this industry especially with the opinions, mainstream media, the attention that's on law enforcement to begin with. But the, the, the truth is that we're really not far apart, regardless of what side of the political spectrum you lie on. Most people just wanna be left alone and they want a police officer to be there and they wanna live in a safe community. They wanna live in a place where they can have their kids play outside and not be worrying about, about danger and crime. Albuquerque's dangerous and there's a lot of crime. We are not effective with the with everything that is going on in the city of Albuquerque Police Department and our staffing is, is the number one resource that, that we need. Um, so I know that there's talk about minimizing the, the budgetary strength of the police department. 
I don't think we're going to come anywhere near 1,100 police officers in the next fiscal year. But I would, I, I think we should, we need to be careful with what we do with that money because at 731 boots on the ground, which has changed, we had, I, I bought four weapons for retired police officers last week. Um, so that, that number continues to dwindle, but we, we need to be careful by not investing in the future of this police department, not being cognizant of the retention and the hiring gaps that we possess and not being cognizant that, you know, if it's important to you to have reform, it's if, if it's important for you to get out of this consent decree, if it's important to have the police department that you desire, that you want, you're going to have to pay for it. And it's getting more expensive every year. Mr. Chairman, I don't if I may answer, if I may answer. If I may answer one question from uh, Councillor Pena. In the uh, PowerPoint, Councillor, there is a breakdown for prisoner transport operators in terms of uh, the budgetary and dollars that actually are, that are, uh, are are in there, as well as the cost uh, of the package and how much it will cost uh, to actually get them uh, uh, between a six and seven or eight percent raise and bringing them up to parity with a. Uh, MDC. If you need additional information, please just email me and uh, I'll be happy to send it out to you. And thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Broom. Do we have any questions from the committee for any of the participants before we go into executive session? I had a quick question. Um, so I am, I'm fully in support of finding a career ladder from PSAs and PTUs into APD. I think we all see that as a good career stepping stone. Um, but I do want to just say and clarify that ACS is not an attribute or a program of APD. ACS is the third branch of public safety in the city of Albuquerque, and that is a new concept. Um, so I'd just love to hear from the gentleman from ACS if they see themselves as um, a stepping stone to APD, or if that is a third branch of, of public safety that has its own set of skills and uh, requirements for that job. I don't believe we have anybody with ACS on with us today, the counselor. We did have someone just a few minutes ago. Um, I don't know if he left, but um, but again. I'm, I'm still here. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Padilla, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mr. Padilla. Thanks, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. Uh, thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councilwoman. Uh, yeah, I, I think that they absolutely see themselves as an independent piece, right? I, I, I truly believe that they see themselves as trying something that is new and is different, and they do not see their jobs as a stepping stone from the conversations that I've had. Um, you know, if if that's the the way that the that the folks from APOA are looking at it, um, it's not something that I've heard from conversations with the people on the ground. Thank you for that clarification, because I, you know, I work closely with ACS and they do amazing work um, and they do respond to all kinds of um, calls in, in my district. I can't speak for the rest of the city um, that do not require an APD um, officer to be with them. And so, you know, I just want us to keep this clear, like there are guidelines and there are ladders to move towards APD that will fully um, staff APD and we should be fully um, pushing all of those and every idea we have to get more people into APD, but we should not be considering ACS as a new idea, or I mean, as an old idea, it is a new idea. We should not be thinking of them as an attribute or a program of an existing city department. They are a new city department and they deserve to be treated with that level of respect. So thank you. Thank you, Councillor. And Mr. Villarreal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to state very quickly that um, um, local 2962's president of Stephanie Gomez, um, um, she wanted to uh, say a few words. Um, she doesn't have, she didn't have the ability to raise her hand on, on, on her platform. So I wanted to note that. All right, Ms. Gomez. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I just wanted to speak. I do represent city clerical, which is also, uh, city in general clerical employees, as well as 911, we're kind of grouped in together. Um, I, and I wanted to speak on behalf of 911 Communications since I am also um, a dispatcher with them just to um, show that uh, we are losing people 
rapidly. It's, uh, to me, in my opinion, it's uh, very critical. Uh, we're losing people to other departments in the city. Some are using us to promote to either, you know, to join the academy. Um, but the biggest issue is um, how much we are working. We are working multiple 16-hour shifts um, every day. Um, it's in our contract that they're allowed to do this, but it was lessened in current contracts because they used to force us 16-hour shifts five days a week. Um, we are seeing officers leave and come back and we're still working. Um, and we're seeing also with the, our cost, even just our starting cost or starting pay between 911 and dispatch. So dispatch is getting paid $2 more than 911 as an incentive to promote. Um, there's other issues with the promotion process with that, which I'm, you know, trying to fix with, uh, communications. Um, but just in comparable cities, uh, regarding population, um, our cap at dispatch um, is at least a couple of dollars below uh, Boulder, Colorado, Phoenix, Arizona, DPS, um, we're at least minimum a couple of dollars lower than their dispatch centers. Um, and we're taking on more responsibilities, as Willie was saying, that, you know, especially with ACS, we have to uh, take on that responsibility. We've taken on uh, telephone reporting unit responsibilities. 911s have to answer that, which is also bombarding them with calls, which you're going to see statistical differences um, over the years because they are now answering that instead of a separate uh, phone line as they were before coming to comm center. Um, and you get new people, they're recruiting, they come in and, you know, you see them wanting to make a difference, but then you see them uh, sitting with, you know, current employees and how much they're getting forced, you know, working and people want to work life balance, you know, there's people with children, they want to go home after they want to know they're going to go home after a certain amount of hours. Like I said, I've lost somebody to ACS, $8 drop in pay, because they know they would go home after eight hours. Uh, and with the, you know, now with the penal lawsuit, I'm looking for people that are asking me to demote to go to other departments just, and they're willing to take huge pay cuts because of the work-life balance. Um, it's hard to keep them, especially when they know they can get paid a, you know, a comparable, comparable amount with other departments in the city. Um, until that gets resolved, um, you know, I don't see us, staffing any faster or as much as that we need at 911 communications um you know they're they're tired and then you know you have to look out for them because like you said they're working so many hours and you know it's like how do you keep them motivated you know you so we try to compensate them with money because as much as, as they're working it's the only incentive i can give them right now uh because there's no way I can take away not forcing having people forced because it's so short staffed. We are considerably low uh, with dispatch. We, you know, we're, we should be right now. I think we're at 24 maybe uh, with a couple of new releases and we have incoming classes. Uh, we should be well over, you know, 30, you know, close to 40 people at least. Um, and it's a, it's an officer safety issue as well. We are having to combine airs. Uh, more so um, on graveyard shift, which is the shift I work. Uh, normally, we'd have six dispatchers, a relief dispatcher. Um, it's been changed now to uh, six dispatchers, and then they combine the air on graveyard. The, the southwest side gets combined. But it's so bad with uh, people calling off sick and just staffing issues. I've seen it where they've combined uh, the west side valley and uh southeast and northeast and foothills you know that's one dispatcher working two airs and some are you, know, you said you're working southeast and you're, you have that combined valley you know that could be a mess at night and it's it's, it's an officer safety issues and also a dispatcher safety issue it's, it's overwhelming um so we need to find a way to you know compensate these people for as many hours as they're working Councillor Fablecorn, you have your hand up. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Gomez. I'm just wondering if you could, and it might be a combination of these, but do you think that the problem, the barrier to hiring more folks is um, pay or is it really just the hours? Um, it's, or is it it's both. I really don't see us um, staffing 
to the numbers that we need anytime soon. And and like I said, I for a lot of people, the the money does keep them there. I have a dispatcher, you know, with the raises that we got them last year, she's making, you know, she's making extra payments on her house. So for some of us that have been there a little bit longer, you know, the money is helpful. Uh, would they want to go home instead? Yes. Um, but like I said, I don't see it staffing anytime soon uh, it, to the numbers that we need. It's just, it's too, you know, it's, it's like I said, people see what's going on and it's hard to, you know, to have people stay, um, you know, seeing as many hours that we work. Sorry about that. Thank you, Ms. Gomez. Does anybody have any more questions before we go into executive session? Seeing none, I make a motion that we go into executive session. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Enriquez? Mr. Chair, it'd be helpful if you articulate the purpose of the executive session um, minimally to at least discuss uh, negotiation status and strategies. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Melendrez. Um, exactly what just Mr. Mr. Melendrez just said. I move to go into executive session to discuss um, any strategies for negotiations um, among the negotiations team. Ms. Enriquez, if you could call a vote. Yes. Councilor Bassan? Yes. Councilor Figo Corn? Yes. Lawrence Davis? Yes. Councilor Pena? Yes. Katarina Sandoval? Yes. Okay, Chairman Michael Dorton. Yes. Thank you. That passes 6 0. Thank you. Mr. Moya, if you could move the um, committee into executive session with the mayor's conference room and uh, the director of human resources um, office. We'll do, Mr. Chair. Just give me a second to send everybody there. And then uh, once you guys are done, you guys can uh, just hit leave room and it'll put you guys back into uh, this main room. <laughs> And including uh, Mr. Ian Stoker, the Assistant City Attorney. Got it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Chairman Doran. Yes, sir. So you guys are prepared. <laughs> How's it going, Mr. Broom? Just a reminder to everybody, this is uh, being live streamed and still live. So um, just <laughs> a heads up for any conversations.
Mr. Doran. Yes, sir. Yeah, can you, you kick, yeah, can you kick me back into the breakout room, please? Yes, we'll do. Thank you. Okay. It appears that everybody is back. Um, I do I need to say that during the executive session, the, we only discussed 
the negotiations and any strategies um, thereof. That moves us on to the last um, agenda item, which is adjournment. I move that we adjourn uh, this meeting. Do I have a second? Second. Ms. Enriquez? I'll turn this on. Yes. Councillor Peeblecorn. Yes. Lawrence Davis. Yes. Councillor Pena. Yes. Is this to adjourn? Because you don't need a motion to adjourn. Oh. I move to adjourn. <laughs> Take care. <laughs> Have a great day, everyone. Take care.